welcome to Dialogue. The U.S. government debt has skyrocketed to an unprecedented $35 trillion, up from $4.4 trillion 30 years ago, and continues to rise at more than a $1 trillion per year. What's behind the ballooning U.S. national debt? Has Washington not been taking the issue seriously? And how will the U.S. government address such a challenge? Join us for our discussion today live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qingduo. Joining me today are Anthony Chan, former chief economist for, uh, from J.P. Morgan Chase, and Brandon Andrews, a former Hill staffer and entrepreneur, and Hong Hao, chief economist of the Grow Investment Group. Welcome to the show. Anthony, I will start with you. So $35 trillion is a I mean, giant number. Uh, so tell us, how, is that a concern? How big a concern? I guess it is a concern for any country. Uh, but how big a concern? Is it for the U.S.? It is a concern. $35 trillion is quite a bit, even relative to the U.S. population of 333 uh, million people. That tells you that uh, the average uh, per capita uh, debt or the per capita debt is about $105,000 per person. So that is a concern because that's a lot of money uh, for every uh, person that's living in the United States. But one of the issues that I want to point out is that over the last 20 to 30 years, the concern with the national debt among the American people has dropped dramatically to the point where the candidates running for president are not talking about reducing the national debt at all. In fact, many of them are talking about cutting taxes, which potentially most economists will tell you uh, will raise the national debt even higher. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Brendan, so it is, um, I mean, it, it is a concern, I, mean, I guess, obviously, for economists. Um, uh, is it a concern for the national leaders? Is it a concern for average Americans? Yeah, it is a concern for national leaders. Um, you've seen over the years, as Anthony alluded to, primarily the Republican Party talk about uh, fiscal solvency, talking about making sure that we're able to pay our debts. But what we've seen over the past two presidential administrations, both Trump and Biden, is significant increases when it comes to spending. Uh, Anthony mentioned the uh, tax cuts. And uh, of course, those tax cuts have a cost when it comes to the uh, ability to be able to collect taxes and service that national debt. Uh, of course, the pandemic required some significant spending uh, from both the Trump and Biden administration to respond to that global crisis. And the interest rates with inflation, now it costs even more to be able to service the debt. Now, we haven't yet had a presidential debate between Vice President Harris and former President Donald Trump. But you have to imagine that during that first debate, the national debt will come up and Americans will be looking for the next president to be able to answer the question, how do we continue to provide services to the American people and service the national debt, especially if we're in a higher for longer environment when it comes to the rate of inflation? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it is an issue. Uh, hopefully, it will come up during the um, upcoming debate between the two candidates. Hong Hao, looking at the issue from outside, and in, in particular, uh, the near future, uh, so do you expect the debt will continue to rise? Uh, because if you look at it um, in January this year, it's 34 trillion, in July, 35 trillion. Obviously, it grows, seems to be more than a trillion dollars for a year. Uh, do you think that's a cause of concern, the speed? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a cause of concern. And I think um, more likely than not, the U.S. debt is going to continue to rise uh, into the next couple of years. If you look at the CBO zone uh, projection, right, so for the uh, physical deficit uh, in the next couple of years, and you can see that, you know, the uh, physical deficit of the U.S. government uh, stayed at a very high level, at about, you know, close to, very close to 7% uh, GDP, right? So to fund that kind of uh, spending gap, you know, you, you just have to continue to issue debt. And also in, a, uh, in this environment, because much of the U.S. debt uh, has been rolling over on a shorter end uh, of, of the portfolio. And so just, just imagine, right, so when you want to refinance, and, and you probably want to refinance on a, a longer end of your treasury bonds. 
and, and therefore, you know, if the interest rate there's an, an interest rate volatility, then it makes it difficult, you know, for the U.S. dollar, uh, U.S. government to refinance. And I think that is the reason why um, one shouldn't be surprised to see uh, the debt ceiling of the U.S. government uh, uh, will continue to rise as well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Brandon, you briefly mentioned about uh, you know the practice uh, during this pandemic crisis a couple of years ago. You you need borrowing to stimulate the economy to s serve uh, you know the public uh, uh, interests. Um, but if you look at the debt itself, you know three decades ago it was just around four trillion dollars. And um, how come the has the U.S. debt grown so much? You know in recent years, can we say in the recent couple of decades maybe? Yeah, well, the infl the pandemic is certainly an outlier when it comes to the increase in spending, but the increase in spending vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the national debt has been increasing, you're correct, over the past few decades. Um, again, there was a very, very strong, uh, in terms of political leadership, uh, focus on ensuring that we kept the national debt low, ensuring that we were able to service our debt. If you remember, Bill Clinton actually balanced the U.S. budget uh, and uh, George W. Bush actually had us on a track to be able to pay off a significant amount of the national debt. And economists were saying, well, we don't want to pay it all off because there could be negative effects if we paid it all off. Now, um, about 20 years later, we're in a very different place when it comes to spending and the environment. Um, again, there have been national crises that have happened, but more broadly, there's been a desire from politicians uh, to spend money uh, to be able to meet the needs of Americans or even in some cases meet the wants of Americans. Uh, and that spending is certainly catching up with the country and it needs to be addressed. And, and again, I think Americans will be looking um, as we go into this uh, fall presidential cycle uh, for answers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anthony, uh, of course, you know, every four years uh, there will be a, there, there is a presidential debate, or, you know, a campaign, election campaign. Um, but, you know, uh, earlier Brandon mentioned about the Clinton uh, time uh, presidency. You know, he's a president actually who uh, created a, a, a budget surplus instead of a deficit, right? But since then, you do see more spending than uh, the government takes in. Uh, so that created uh, this uh, this problem, you know, mounting debt, right? That's right. Uh, we see that over time, uh, people in the White House have been less disciplined when it comes to managing uh, those finances, as Brandon uh, Andrews has pointed out. Uh, we know that uh, right now the Republican candidate is talking about eliminating taxes on Social Security benefits, eliminating taxes on tip income. Uh, extending the tax cuts, which the Congressional Budget Office is telling us that it will raise the national debt anywhere from four to five trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, and so there's even talk of uh, eliminating all federal income taxes and just replacing them with tariffs. So in short, all these factors and the Democrat uh, presidential candidate talking about eliminating tip income, whether all of these ideas come through, I guarantee that the national debt will continue to increase to even more dangerous uh, uh, high levels. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it will continue to increase. But Anthony, uh, do you think this, I mean, people would say alarming milestone of $35 trillion, uh, do you think that come earlier than you expected? I think that if we continue along this path, we are going to have a wake-up call. You remember a couple of decades ago, everybody talked about the so-called bond vigilantes that actually pushed interest rates higher. But these days, we're not seeing the bond vigilantes or uh, showing too much concern, even though if you look at uh, recent government uh, bond uh, uh, measures or, or auctions, what you're seeing is the tail on those auctions is coming in around three basis points in the last auction. What does that mean? That means that if you look at the futures market before the auction and then the actual auction, uh, the actual auction ended up uh, requiring for the 10-year Treasury an extra three basis points. So that's an early sign uh, that the financial markets or that the bond markets are a little concerned with the debt, but it's still a, just a mild sign. Uh, and until the American people really get concerned with this, uh, we're not going to see our national politicians worry about it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, Hong Kong, uh, the International Monetary Fund recently warned uh, that these uh, chronic fiscal deficits uh, represent a significant and persistent policy misalignment that needs to be urgently addressed. Uh, so what kind of a misalignment, you know, policy misalignment in the U.S. do you see? Yeah, well, um, if, if, you, if you look at the Japanese situation, right, the, the U.S. situation is slightly better in the sense that, you know, if you look at the debt to GDP ratio, uh, it's just over 100%. Right? So uh, the Japanese government is, is really in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. And so I think as a result, as you can see, right, the, uh, the Japanese yen has been de depreciating substantially. Uh, there was a huge volatility in the uh, Japanese JGB bond market and also in the, in the Japanese stock market as well. And, and it sends ripple across the world uh, and, and affecting other financial markets. And I think you know, it's telling you that you know, when the debt level is at such a sustainably, unsustainably high level, uh, it, it creates difficulty for everyone. So I think specifically for the U.S. government, you know, because it has a lot of liabilities to meet. You know, for example, the pension, the pension fund, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, amongst the other things. Right. So, uh, and, and as as the uh, population grows uh, older, right, and, and also uh, the economic growth slow down, then it will create even more uh, liabilities. You know, for the government. Uh, so I think as a result, you know, the the CBO budget uh, looking out in the in the next couple of years is looking at about seven percent negative 7% GDP uh, for each of the uh, next couple of years. Uh, so I think it's, it's telling you that a monumental task uh, that is confronting the U.S. government to refinance all this debt. And then, you know, once you cannot refinance, for example, there's a debt limit uh, that we discussed just now, then, you know, you have to go through all the uh, uh, congressional debate, you know, how to, uh, how to raise the uh, debt, limit, uh, debt limit for the U.S. government to borrow more, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we've all seen this movie before in the, in the last couple of years because of very large spending during the pandemic. Uh, the debt level has been increased uh, for a number of times now. Right? So every time, you know, when there's a debt limit negotiation, you know, the, the market goes into a panic mode. Uh, so I think I would be surprised to see uh, when we see these kind of scary movies again and again in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Hongho, you mentioned about the consequences of uh, you know, such a high debt level. Uh, some economists suggest that economic growth will slow down, uh, significantly slow down, uh, once the national debt passes 90% of the annual GDP, uh, basically the debt to GDP ratio uh, to 90%. But the US case is, uh, uh, is like a, you know, a 20, yeah. So that put the US debt uh, to more than 120, 130 to 30% well over 90 percent uh, range you know so uh, but the u.s economy is okay i mean it's not in trouble right uh not yet <laughs> no, not um, yet okay i mean obviously the uh, the economy is still uh, uh remaining very resilient and i think the the view that you quoted just now is a line view you know you know she's saying that you know if, you, if it's over 90 percent it's cre it's creating a gross hurdle uh, for uh, for the economy now if, if you look forward uh, you know as you can see, despite a very high debt level, you know, the U.S. productivity growth has been rather strong you know, because of the AI revolution that is happening. And that is, you know, and then also all the uh, immigrants, either legal or illegal immigrants going into the U.S. border. And that creates a huge pool of labor supply uh, for the U.S. economy and also you know, some newfound uh, productivity growth uh, elements in there as well. So I think as a result, you know, the, the U.S. Uh, economy is remaining very resilient right now. But I think, you know, it has passed the peak of the cycle. And I'll be surprised to see in the next couple of months, we'll see a very prominent sign of slowing down. And the Federal Reserve will have to act to cut interest rate to slow down, uh, to, uh, to cushion uh, the economic slowdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Brandon, what kind of consequences do you see with uh, such a high debt level at $35 trillion and is it growing? Well, I think Hong really hit it, hit the nail on the head with this. There is a reluctance from our political leaders to talk about entitlements. Now, we know that Medicare is on a path, Social Security, they're on a path to insolvency. And when you look at this generationally, you look at millennials, you look at Gen Z, um, you look at younger Americans, we know even coming out of high school and college that those things aren't going to be around for us. 
but neither party, political party, wants to talk about that insolvency. And so, yes, there's a risk when it comes to debt to GDP ratio, when it comes to the broader economy, when it comes to the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency. But I think when you talk about everyday Americans, the reluctance from political leaders to have these tough conversations in the face of data that we've known for decades when it comes to insolvency for some of these entitlement programs is really political malpractice. And so, yes, there's potentially some concerns when it comes to debt to GDP ratio, but I think the bigger impact is on everyday Americans if our leaders don't address these issues when it comes to entitlements and, and that spending. Uh, but uh, Brandon, I mean, for individuals, uh, it is a long term uh, long term implications, you know, it is not affecting people's daily lives uh, in the near future, right? Well, if you're a younger American and you're not expecting Social Security, you're not expecting Medicare to be there, that means you've got to put more into your 401k. That means maybe you're paying more into your 401k instead of purchasing a home, instead of purchasing other things. So, yes, these the insolvency is far further out. However, as a younger American, it's affecting your decision making every day because you don't expect that um, backstop. You don't expect that support during retirement to be there in the same way that it has been for previous generations. So I, I completely get the point that you're making. But um, as a younger American, it's something that we think about from a financial planning, from a family planning standpoint, uh, you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anthony, um, and because the U.S. is the largest economy in the world, you know, whatever U.S. policy, you know, uh, there is, you know, often it has some effects around the world. Uh, so, I mean, if there's, if obviously, there's uh, some impact on the U.S. economy in terms of its growth, uh, in terms of probably, uh, as Brandon mentioned about the U.S. dollar, it's a reserve currency. Will that have any impact on the status of the U.S. dollar? Well, of course, uh, if there is a lot of nervousness out there, uh, it could have an impact. But in international economics, there's a theory out there called the smile theory, which says that, that whenever there's a crisis and people are worried, they gravitate towards the dollar. And they also say that whenever uh, all of a sudden there's turbulence around the world, uh, then they also gravitate against the dollar. So whether there's turbulence in the U.S. or across the world, uh, they gravitate towards the dollar. And today, 58% of all the foreign exchange reserves are still in the dollar. So that's more than 50%. And in fact, there are many factors that people have to worry about. As Hung, Hao, uh, men Hung Han mentioned, uh, that the U.S. has been financing a lot of the debt short term. Yes, that to some people may seem irresponsible, but as the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, guess what? That's actually a beneficial to the U.S. because now uh, you actually can turn that debt over at lower interest rates. If you would have floated that debt at long term rates, you would have been locked in. So that actually can turn out to be a positive. With regard to the U.S. economy, if you look at growth for GDP in the last quarter, around 2.3 percent. Right now, the Atlanta Federal Reserve is telling us that in the third quarter, you may get growth uh, to exceed the 2.3 percent. So growth is actually going to accelerate something closer to 2.3 percent. 9%. So, so far, we're not seeing a huge sign that the U.S. economy is anywhere near a recession. And by the way, potential growth in the United States is about 1.8%. And we've been growing above 1.8% last year. This year, we'll probably grow again. So, don't see any real serious uh, signs of, uh, of collapse with the economy. But I do agree with everyone on the panel that as you go into the future quarters, of course, the U.S. economy is going to slow down because we know that this economy can continue growing at this at this fast pace. And that's one of the reasons why uh, for the next Federal Open Market Committee meeting, the debate is between cutting rates by a quarter percentage point and cutting rates by 50 basis points. That, of course, will be determined by the next three uh, inflation reports. We're getting to this week consumed producer price index, consumer price index. And later in the month, we're going to be looking at the personal consumption deflator inflation report. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anthony, the IMF uh, in a statement uh, said that, you know, there is a temptation to postpone decisions related to debt and deficits for the future rather than pay them, um, you know, when the sun is shining and the conditions are good. Basically, it is says that this is the time for the U.S. Um, I mean, to deal with that because the economy uh, is strong, it is growing. 
Uh, do you think this is a point, this is the time for the government to deal with the issue? Absolutely. You're spot on. That's exactly what the U.S. government should do. Historically, when you have a recession, that's when you have a bigger deficit. When you have economic expansion, you should be cutting back on that deficit. But the question is, why did they not do it? Well, we know that we have an aging infrastructure problem. We know that in China, they spent a lot of money building the infrastructure. In the United States, we haven't done as well. So now we're spending a lot of money to fix our infrastructure that's badly needed. We're also spending more money to strengthen the supply chains. You can debate back and forth whether those uh, funds are, should have uh, been spent or not. But certainly on the infrastructure front, I think uh, it's pretty clear uh, that we should have done it. And then with regard to making the U.S. more energy efficient, maybe more green, that is something that is being pursued aggressively in China. And now we're starting to do the same thing in the United States. So you can make the argument that was a top priority. But yes, in the wake of all that, it is causing these high deficits, which need to be controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Hong Kong, you know, IMF would say, uh, you know, uh, whichever uh, party uh, dominated the White House uh, starting next year, I mean, their policy should be inclu uh, including the tax rise. Uh, but if you look at the candidates right now, do you expect any tax rise to solve this problem? Um, I think Donald Trump wants to cut uh, business tax further to 15 percent, right? So it's even lower than what it is now. So I think, uh, you know, Trump is, is uh, in favor of a lower tax environment. And I think, you know, in the economic theory, you know, if you lower uh, tax rate uh, low enough, then it will create incentive for people to work and pay even more tax. Uh, so <laughs> that was the theory. But, you know, right now, given the situation, uh, the budgetary situation is so the higher, uh, you know, you're looking at about, you know, minus 7% GDP uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, lower tax would actually help, right? So it really, really, really depends on, you know, how you're going to uh, structure the tax cut, right? So on one hand, you probably want to give more incentive uh, for the business uh, to relocate back to the U.S. and lower the incentive for, for, for the business uh, to, to transfer tax uh, uh, revenue uh, to a foreign country to evade U.S. tax. And then, but then at the same time, you know, the money has to come from somewhere. Uh, you know, pay off, for example, the interest rate. Right, so all the uh, uh, social liabilities that you have, and plus the infrastructure, uh, Anthony just mentioned. Right, so it's it's a really challenging task, and I, I don't think uh, the the U.S. government is now in an enviable situation right now. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying that uh, is you know you cannot solve it in a short period of time? It's a long term. It requires a long term policy or require long term strategy to deal with the debt issue. Yeah, I think it's a it's a long term uh, secular. A structure shift it require a, a long-term government resolve uh, to sort of uh, resolve the problem. Uh, so I think right now we're not seeing any of those. I think both the candidates, uh, you know, arriving for uh, boosting the economy, and therefore you know they believe that lower lower tax uh, would actually help uh, to achieve that goal. Uh, so let's wait and see. You know, right now you know the presidential election is going full drive. Uh, it remains to be seen. You know, which uh, candidate comes forward. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how the tax regime will change in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Brandon, uh, do you see there is a political resolve uh, to deal with the issue, um, you know, in the next couple of years or next uh, couple of governments, uh, administration, uh, to deal with this uh, inflating problem because people would expect that uh, would continue to grow in the next, uh, next uh, years to come? Yeah, I think on the inflation side and interest rates, it's so interesting. Uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, is actually the most active Fed chair in the history of the position. If you look at his meetings, and all of this is tracked, he's done the most meetings with uh, consumers. He's done the most meetings with uh, leaders on Capitol Hill. He's done the most meetings with other government leaders. So he's really trying to make sure that he keeps his finger on the pulse of things. Now, that hasn't yet led to actually making a decision when it comes to cutting rates. But yes, it's something that has to be addressed by the next administration, whoever it is. But I think more broadly, as we think about America and the economy, we really have to focus on continuing to be in a leadership position when it comes to innovation, in a leadership position when it comes to a strong economy. You look over the past three years, record numbers of Americans have started new businesses. 
literally every year over the past three years, we've seen a record number of new small businesses. And so I think, yes, we want to focus on this question of the national debt and how to service it properly. But we also need to focus on innovation and ensuring that these small businesses reach their full economic potential, because if they do, that's going to continue to put America in a, in a very, very strong position when it comes to the economy and help us balance out the debt, which, of course, is, is going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony, uh, when the next, uh, say, uh, the, um, discipline, uh, let's say, they say uh, deadline uh, arrives, uh, for example, next one would be January 1st. Uh, so there will be debate about uh, whether to raise the debt ceilings or, you know, we'll continue with the suspension of the debt limit. Uh, so what do you see um, for the new government uh, in January? Well, I continue to see political bickering because the reality is I think it's kind of silly to have those meetings because when they talk about raising the national debt, it's to basically to pay for things that the U.S. already spent money on. This is not necessarily for future spending. So I think nobody should be debating whether we should pay the bills that we've already uh, spent uh, purchasing products. We should be coming up with ideas on how to reduce that debt in the future uh, rather than debating about whether we should pay for prior bills. Uh, I agree with the two panel members, uh, Hung Hao, uh, talking about uh, uh, having to worry about this on a long-term basis. He, he is correct that we've been able to grow the economy because population growth because of immigration has helped. Uh, but Remember, Robert Solo, one of the famous growth economists, just passed away last December, 99 years old. He based his research, lifetime research, he won a Nobel Prize, basically said that economic growth is composed of uh, capital equipment, uh, population, but 80%, as Brandon Andrews talks about, is innovation. And artificial intelligence could be the key to that innovation. And that's what's going to generate higher growth. So we can talk about increasing population, more machines, but it's business innovation. 80% of that will bring up potential GDP. And that's what we need to continue to focus on. Because the faster we grow, guess what happens? We can pay our national debt a lot easier if we're growing faster. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Hao, uh, innovation obviously is an important factor for any country to grow the economy I mean, more, in a more healthy manner. Um, but is that enough to service I mean, the interest and service the debt long term, which is also growing? Um, well, if you can keep the interest rate low enough, right? So you, you, you really need to grow uh, uh, in a disinflationary environment. Uh, so in the past uh, 20 years, since China uh, joined the WTO, uh, China was able to help, you know, to keep the cost down. Right? So the world enjoyed a disinflationary group. Right? So it makes it a lot easier to pay off the debt, you know, because you're growing so fast, and then at the same time, inflation is under control. But, you know, just imagine, you know, you have, you know, 40 trillion uh, US dollars worth of debt, you know, and, and the interest rate is at four, four plus percent. Right. So that, that would make it really difficult to maintain such high level of debt. You know, right now, for example, you know, much of the budget of the U.S. government uh, now is starting to go to pay off the interest rate payment uh, uh, periodically. Right. So that is a cause of concern already. Right. So I think going forward, you know, you, you really need to want to make sure that the debt you incur is really being put back uh, to grow your economy rather than just to service your debt. Well, on that note, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.